Your, is your last name Dead Hum? Deedum. 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 Like should freedom. Get, should I get that right? <laughs> sure. Okay. And I just got ready to start hanging and banging Z. Start hanging and banging. Start hanging and banging Z. Um, hey, thanks for joining us. This is our first uh, pilot episode here of Hanging and Banging. Um, what you know, we're gonna explore some different topics about stonemasonry. I'm I'm here with um, Alfred Deedham, owner of Vermont Heritage Granite Company. Um, my name's Graham Walerzak. Um, I'm I'm a mason myself, and um, I'm here to kind of just try to have a little conversation about the stuff we've encountered in the trades. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people out there uh, in the stone community and through social media, it's uh, it's really kind of shrunk down the world and we're able to kind of communicate and uh, talk about the trade a little more. So Alfred and I here thought we would just kind of start a conversation and see what happens and see where it goes. Um, so I'm going to start by asking um, Alfred here a few questions. Um, first of all, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Alfred. Yeah, my name is uh, Alfred Deedham. I'm My business is Old Goat Masonry. I have this quarry now too, the Vermont Heritage Granite Company, and um, based in northern Vermont, Peachum, Vermont is is where I hail from, and uh, yeah, so my work I do is up in in northern Vermont, which is where we are right now. You know, we're sitting in the truck here. We wanted to be outside by this beautiful granite chimney we're building out of Alfred Stone, but it's whipping so hard. I mean, it's April here, but it's still like you know probably more winter than a lot of you guys have worked in and it, it's muddy season so it's the combo of cold muddy crappy um but yeah we're getting it done so we're in here so you can hear us because the wind is so bad so it's pretty fitting the pilot episode had a nice little change of plans um, out of the gate um so um alfred how many years have you been in masonry i've been uh, 19 years in the trade i think uh i started when i was 20 um, I just turned 39 now, so I think June 11th, you know, my buddy Zach is when I, his birthday is when I started, it was my first day at work, and um, yeah, so June 11th I think will mark 19 years, pretty sure it's 19 years. Nice, and, and um, what's your what's your background in masonry, like what inspired you to get your start in the field, or uh, so on? Um, you know, so I was 20. My work experience between high school and that point was in uh, kitchens. I worked in a, in a small cafe and then in a, in a deli making sandwiches and stuff like that. And at that point in my life, I was just working jobs. You know, I wasn't on a career path at all. And my heart wasn't really in it. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that making sandwiches wasn't, you know, my long-term plan. And, uh, you know, a friend came through the deli one day and he had done some work for a local stonemason and he knew that that same stonemason was, was hiring for the summer. So he came through the, uh, the deli and said, Alfred, I got, I got a summer's worth of work for you. Just, you know, just call this guy, just call Devin. And, uh, and I did and started working with this residential stonemason in the area. We, you know, that summer we, um, did a bunch of walls, brick patio, did a massive brick patio, and a uh, big fireplace. A pretty nice diversified portfolio of, of work that first season and a good good taste of, of everything. And uh, I read, yeah, I mean. Maybe. So at that point, I know you had mentioned that you eventually traveled out to Montana and worked for a while. And um, so when you, after a few years working back here, did you go to Montana specifically to, for work as a Mason, feeling you'd had acquired enough skills? And how, how long specifically uh, were you here working in Vermont before you uh, went to Montana? So I worked two, two summers here in Vermont. And then just my life circumstances kind of changed and I it was it was good for me to go out and experience the world you know because that I moved to Montana in 2005 at 21 years old and I needed a you know good taste of the world um one of the guys I worked with for Devin he had gone out to Montana about six maybe nine months before and gotten a job as a as a foreman on a pretty large crew so you know he told me there's work and uh, so, you know, Montana always had a certain appeal to me, and I had a guy out there who had work for me, so I um, took, a, took a train out, took a train out in October of 2005 at 21 years old, and that was uh, quite the experience. Um, and so, now, where, where is the, how do we connect the dots back from you going out to Montana 
to kind of, you know, um, experience the world, try out your trade, and coming back here to Vermont, and ultimately owning or reopening a quarry. So, I moved out west at 21, two years of experience. Uh, was working on these large uh, custom ski homes in Big Sky, Montana. Big, massive, multi-million dollar structures. And I, you know, I showed up as a laborer and uh, mixing mud and I spent four and a half years with that company. We we're pretty much strictly doing full bed veneer on these ski homes out there. And uh, I worked, you know, worked hard as a laborer for a couple of years, maybe a year and a half or so. And then, you know, at, with that natural progression, I ended up on the wall. Spent quite a bit of time on the wall and I became a, a foreman for that crew that was kind of um, a victim of circumstance I'd say more than more than merit um, the other masons on the on the crew they were actually all from Vermont too they decided to go off and start their own business so the uh, the project manager he asked me to stay and offered me the position battlefield as a promotion yeah, yeah battlefield yeah. promotion exactly <laughs> yeah. So, you know, stayed there with uh, Continental Construction, worked, as, you know, in a foreman capacity for about a year and a half. I started corresponding with, with a girl back here in Vermont that I had dated in high school. And, um, and so in 2008, I decided to come back here and visit her for an extended period of time. Took a little bit of a sabbatical from work in Montana. And, um, and then ultimately in 2010, I moved back here to, to be with her and, you know, we got married and, um, yeah, so, you know, we have three kids now. So, um, back to, you know, your foreman role that you had in Montana, um, at that point, you know, kind of making the unexpected jump with your level of skill and what you'd experienced, how did you feel about taking on that foreman role and telling other people what to do and being expected to be a go-to for, for your knowledge? You know, it was interesting because I was so young. I didn't know what I didn't know. But the the type of work we were doing was so specific. It's just straight up full bed veneer. I didn't, strictly speaking, need to have a diversified knowledge of the trade mm -hmm. in general in mm -hmm. order in order to kind of run a crew on the, on this job site, because you know we're just doing full bed veneer all the way and just thousands and thousands of square feet around this house um and i was always good about you know interacting with with the office you know because there was there was an administrative staff on site there and, and i was always a pretty good liaison between them and the rest of the masonry crew so that you know that part kind of came easily to me and that's like a skill that's lost everyone talks about how good of a mason you are or this is how much money you make but like the ability to have conversations with different types of people, you know, and, and put different hats on, go talk to a homeowner, go talk to another boss, go talk to an employee. Those type of conversational skills are essentially what set people apart and can make or break, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, well, we, you know, we've been working together for the last two weeks and we've had conversations on the wall about the, just the importance of, of grammar. Um, in correspondence with people, you know, that that's often the first thing, uh, you know, that's, that's somebody's first interaction with you. Very and in often. general with contractors, I've found that you're always, if you've never met someone before, you're always, um, working against the worst story they've ever heard about a contractor. So right off the, the gate, they're going to have their guard up and like, is this guy, uh, you know, generally with word of mouth, you know, in, in type of jobs, if you're not advertising, you're going to go in with a customer. They're going to have a decent idea about you, but until you really meet somebody and just like anywhere in life, they don't really know about you. So, you know, that, that, um, that first impression and leaving the realm of like stereotypical grungy rude you know all like the stuff that you know that people say about uh, contractors and specifically masons because you know it, whether or not, not people know it in the world of hierarchy of trades you know masons can be some of the rough and tumblest and dingiest and dirtiest and you know so finding masons concerned about grammar i wouldn't say is the norm but that doesn't mean it's not going to set you apart Right. Yeah. So, 
So you got back here to Vermont, you've been corresponding, you know, you ultimately got married, had kids, and then so you set up shop around here, and then what led to the Cory? Yeah. So, um, you know, 2008 was that big financial crisis, and by the time I moved back in 2010, the economy, especially in rural Vermont, hadn't fully recovered, so I wasn't able to find employment as a stonemason. However, there are a few little opportunities for me to um, do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Just like a little walkway here that felt like it, you know, felt like a 3,000 square foot patio, you know, in terms of handling it by myself. But um, anyway, because I couldn't find any op opportunities for employment, I, I started my own company, Old Goat Masonry. I think, I mean, 2010. So I guess I would have been 26 at the time. And, uh, you know, we've been working that business ever since. So, like, I guess 12 years self-employed. Um, ultimately, got pretty lucky, you know, finding this this quarry. Um, you know, for a lot, I got pretty burnt out, kind of wasn't like a full-on mental health crisis. But I, you know, I experienced a pretty pretty bad bout of depression and uh now it's just really burnt out and feeling trapped in my career as a mason it's just, it just felt like subsistence masonry and like a perpetual grind that wasn't ever gonna bear any fruit so i was trying to trying to seek out other opportunities and um i started building these these clamps like giant brick tongs for lifting granite steps or just stone pieces um talon stone clamps I had a lot of fun learning about you know metal working and such and manufacturing and so i uh at 30 i guess i was 36 i started pursuing an education at uh, vermont tech vermont technical college for manufacturing engineering technology which is like a uh, mechanical engineering with a focus on on manufacturing um they have a really poor hockey team just so. they, they have a poor hockey team yeah we used to play them that was, that was the practice games <laughs> you can edit that out if you need yeah we uh <laughs> I, I i didn't i didn't i wasn't a big man on campus but, um i don't know it was fun going to school but it's just too expensive um i mean the tuition was one thing but the lost wages just it was a I, I couldn't afford to not work, so I had to drop out of school, and uh, which I felt kind of bad about because, you know, still feeling burnt out. You know, there's nothing new with the masonry, and just fortunate circumstances found this uh, real estate listing for this abandoned quarry, and it was a you know, an attainable sum of money, um, and. Uh, Went and looked at it and was able to make an offer and, and you know, it was, it was a little bit, I offered less than what the, what the asking price was and it was accepted and, uh, which kind of, kind of blew my mind. So that was, so it's 2023 right now. That was last spring, 2022, bought the quarry, 66 acres in South Rygate, Vermont. And, uh, with about one, one and a half acres where they were actively quarrying from like 1905, 1906 up into the mid 30s. So, so what were um, in, in that period? What specifically do you know in the region they were quarrying for? Do you know? Do you know that? Or from what I can tell, they were quarrying for quote rock faced monument bases. Okay, is the stone that they were that they were cutting. Um, it was operated by the Rosa brothers. I think they're an Italian uh, duo, and they had a. They had a, a shed, you know, a stone shed down in, in South Rygate. Um, and I think they operated their shed for a number of years before before opening this, this quarry. And, uh, you know, we drove through South Rygate the other day. And it's, you know, there's not much going on there today. But It looks like it could use a few quarries opening up and maybe employing <laughs> some local folks. It, yeah, it, it, it sure could. Hundred years ago, there was a railroad that ran up that valley, the Wells River Valley, um, and that railroad was hauling granite and, and lumber. And uh, there were a number of, of stone sheds down in South Rygate, and then there were 
uh, six at one time, at one point in time, there were six operating quarries three miles up the road up on, on Blue Mountain. And uh, so it's it's a really interesting and so it's like so podcast, if so. somebody um, somebody listening to this might not like be familiar with what uh, like a mason might be excited about in owning a quarry and thinking like oh so this guy is getting into the rock face monument business um, monument monument based business like that's not necessarily the case so you know I, I personally know the things I get excited about when going into old quarries with tailing piles but uh, um, what about what about what is still remaining there um, did, excited you about the quarry and it made you really want to buy it well the most the most visible elements of that quarry are the grout piles. There are two grout piles that extend off. So what's what's grout? Just so maybe if we're doing this from the beginning, like what's what's grout for yeah, someone who might yeah, not know? That's a good question. Grout is a you know, industry term for just waste material, um, waste blocks of granite, and um, they can be pretty significant irregular boulders. Uh, so like baseball to Volkswagen. Yeah. Yeah, baseball to Volkswagen. Okay. And um, so as far as I can tell from the workflow back then, they'd find natural seams in the stone, in the mountain, in the granite, in the mountain, work big irregular blocks free off of those natural seams. However, you know, whether they're splitting or, you know, I think they were using dynamite too get big irregular blocks and then cut out of the middle the nice dimensional rectangular blocks that they're using for these bases and then you have all the off-cut pieces that were of no use to, to them you know those operators being in the monument base so they just literally throw them over the hill and the hill just kept growing and growing and growing from all this waste and so there's I mean, there's just a huge amount of material in there that can be processed into different. Um, These hills are like the size of office buildings to give like the to give perspective. You know, they're mount. They're more like mini mountains of separate chunks of stone ranging from baseball to Volkswagen. Yeah. You know, and yeah, um, I don't know if, in, if if when we get fancy, we can splice pictures into this podcast. You know, when we're killing it later. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, there you could. It, any you could do anything with it you know a lot of uh, people will take that stuff they'll split it up it's just it's not something that ever cro crossed my mind as a possibility for i don't know why um but that yeah that, being able to use my material on my jobs is has been pretty lucrative um so that's right there even if you don't have the opportunity to buy a quarry sometimes salvage sometimes looking for deals on things that stone is weird because everyone values it differently you know one man's could some guy could pay you to take the stone off his property that you turn around and sell to somebody else for 300 bucks a ton you never know like especially like field stone and you know things like that um some people just don't know how much it's worth so if you own just random old stone walls out there you know you can palletize it look for things stones with 90 degree angles on them you know moss on the face those things are worth their weight in gold no pun intended yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, like a chunk of granite is worth so much on the grout pile. It's yeah. worth a little bit more on the back of a truck. Yeah, it's worth, yeah. work, you know, worth even more. You Hit know, it with it, a couple of chisels. Exactly. Throw a diamond blade through it. So every time you, every time you handle that, that stone, you're, you're increasing its value, even if you're just moving it because... Well, that's one of the most ex things why stone costs so much money is moving it around. You know what I mean? Like, there's lots of stone out there. I mean, our, our planet is made out of it. It's more like getting, like, if your um, quarry had a, a road, two-lane highway to it, I mean, you could li you will liquidate that place, you know what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. like, the, the work you would have to do right now to get out all of your stone is really going to limit the volume, you know, which also is, like, pretty interesting because it's not... You know, people think about quarrying as like this high impact, environmentally destructive activity, but to like make it clear, you know, your your quarrying up there seems you know as natural as somebody, you know, having you know I don't know a deer eating a plant that's going to grow back. You're you're cleaning up someone else's mess and using someone else's waste in a really interesting way. So, yeah, um, 
I could have said that more eloquently, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Well, no, I'm just really psyched you brought deer eating plants into this conversation yeah, because yeah. we, you know, people don't talk about that quite enough. No, no, they definitely they definitely don't. don't. Yeah. So that's actually shout out to the deer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's. Uh, well, I mean, so then, what are your next? What, after your five year, what's your long term goals here? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make that assessment probably in five years. Got it. I, I don't anticipate laboring, you know, into my fifties mm-hmm. or or sixties. I mean, maybe I do because I don't have a retirement. Throw a yurt out there. Some hipster was paying big <laughs> right. bucks to camp in your little quarry. Yeah, you know, I'd be I'd be glad to to build it up into a business that somebody else could take over. Um, you know, whether it be one of my children or, or maybe some denizen of uh, of the village of South Raggate, you know, if if it's a business that that can run, you know, I'd be let, glad to have somebody run with it. Um, otherwise, you know, part of the justification for buying buying the property is is it's kind of the closest thing I have to a retirement account, you know. So if I can put some value into that property, turn around and sell it. Yeah. In ten years, mm-hmm. um, if you could instruct someone else and say, "Here is how you're, ma- I'm making money," it's like right. selling a business with them. Anytime you're, anytime you own the real estate that your business is on, you're already doing way better than the guy who's leasing or renting. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, well, I mean, you know, one interesting thing that we both wanted to ask each other, kind of, can you know, be a good roundup here is we both kind of worked all you know in different places, places in the U.S. and like. Um, what what are some what some interesting things that you found that contrast in working in different parts of the United States? Yeah, so my tenure in uh, in Montana, I was working in the Yellowstone Club, a private private ski resort and golf club, insanely high end, like some of the highest end construction in the United States, as far as I can tell. Um, it was, you know, during the day, it was its own little city with just guys in the trades next and work, working next to guys in the trades and I never met a homeowner um while I was you know four and a half years while well, we were building these homes on speculation n- a number of them sold halfway through con- construction um but I never met a homeowner well except for once he, he actually threw a dinner for us and it was really nice but that's it, undermining your argument um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it is undermining <laughs> Uh, but you know, working, working back here in Vermont, it's like, well, as a one man show, residential masonry, that's all I'm working for is homeowners, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now I live in this, this realm where people routinely bring out cups of coffee at, you know, 10 AM or whatever. And and I have really, you know, a lot of my, not the tea and crumpets. No, I'm not, not doing that dry stack stuff um, <laughs> no, that was, um, Ooh, right across the bow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean it's just just the scale and that's probably unique to my circumstances um, but you know small scale construction for individuals which you know which I enjoy because I've you know I've assembled some some customers that a list of customers that have become pretty good friends it's hard to find masonry customers who are repeat masonry customers who aren't like pretty loaded because you know it's like a lot of people save up for something masonry is more expensive than most other things and it's not like uh sometimes when you build something out of stone it's not gonna rot or need maintenance so it's not like you gotta build it again or come back and fix it or like so you really need somebody who's either really impressed with your work or has multiple properties or you know, has a long-term project that they can afford piecemeal, you know, things like that. So, um, having customers that you can count on is really, really key. Yeah. 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 And I have, yeah. And it's just nice to find somebody who appreciates your work and recognizes what goes into it and, and are willing to be supportive of it because you know sticker shock's really real with this with this type of stuff. Oh boy, yeah. Specific, especially for specific elements of masonry itself like stone walls a lot of people are not f- familiar with how much it actually costs to uh see you later there oh, 
me and crash into the old tundra. <laughs> the construction butler's sitting in the, in the tundra right now. He's crying about how long we're taking, but <laughs> he's part of Leprechaun. Yeah. We are right. So what's a piece of advice? We'll wrap it up here on this side. Uh, what's your piece of advice you give somebody? Anything come to mind? Who's like wants to be a Mason? Besides stay in school? Um, don't buy stupid shit. Yeah, that's a good one. Like, putting nice wheels on your work truck is a waste of money. I mean, if you spend $1,500 on wheels, you could spend $1,500 on a nice used mixer that'll make you money. Right. Um, the means of production. Right. Like invest, you know, you don't have to invest in Google. Just invest in things that will make you more money rather than things that are just depreciating immediately. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you can... If you can spend some money on stuff that'll set you apart, then, I th you know, I think Like it's, Pokemon cards, right? Like, well, like limited edition Pokemon right, cards. Right, like one of those, like, um, Blizzard Chizards? Mm -hmm. I don't know. A, a, a Blizzard Chizard, yeah, okay. probably. Yeah. Um, but one of the special ones. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I got it, I got it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just got just to be discerning. Got to understand. That's great advice, that's great advice. Well, um, well, thanks for your time answering those questions. Um, hopefully we haven't horrified anyone just yet, but I'm yet to go, so this thing may still be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>